when do you start when someone is starting to train or getting back into it? You know, you mentioned you'll start them in the zone two a few days a week. Obviously, zone two, two days a week, 30 minutes is a lot different than a VO2 max exercise, which can take a lot more. So how do you have your patients in that age bracket 50 and plus? When do you have them start training for VO2 max? How do you have them start training? How do you think about that? So a couple of things. One, um, again, you, you know, the, the wider the base, the higher the peak. So I want to build a reasonable aerobic base before I start pushing VO2 max. And by the way, you do experience increases in VO2 max just from base building um, aerobic activity. So um, if you take a person who's completely deconditioned and you put them into just a zone two program and you slowly add duration um, and frequency to that, and then you retest their VO2 max, it'll be higher even if they have never done a single interval. But ultimately, to really start to boost VO2 max, you are going to need to add more intense movement. Um, I think that the easiest way to do that and the way we typically do it with our patients in a really detrained individual or untrained individual is just to add a little bit of interval training to the zone two workout. So for example, if a person is doing their zone two on a treadmill and let's say you've got them walking three miles an hour and, you know, after a few months, they can handle three miles an hour at 4% or 5% incline, you say, great, I want you to finish uh, the workout doing five one minute quote unquote bursts where you increase the slope from 5% to 10%. And you're just going to do it for a minute. Um, and that's going to really tire them out. You do a minute on and take a minute off, a minute on, take a minute off. So you start to get them used to increasing the intensity. And this also becomes a chance to assess, um, is this going to be something that they can do safely or are they going to completely deteriorate in form? Um, so, you know, I'll just, I'll give you an example of something I used to do. So I used to do really, really, what I think is looking back, I mean, I'm lucky I never got injured, but I used to do some really stupid things for VO2 max training um, that uh, I think put me at too great a risk for injury. So I used to do deadlift Tabatas. Um, so, you know, I would put 225 pounds on a bar and see how many reps I could do in 20 seconds, take 10 seconds off and repeat that eight times. Now, did that do a lot for my VO2 max? Oh, you can bet it did. But, you know, when I think about like the risk I was putting myself under from a movement perspective, being under that much fatigue in the seventh and eighth round of that, where you're trying to push harder and harder, I, I just don't think that makes any sense. And I mean, that doesn't make sense in someone like me who has a lot of training background. I, you know, so, so what do I want to do? I want to make sure that they're doing these intervals, which we'll talk about in a second in an activity where the form isn't going to deteriorate to the point of injury. Now, let's talk about the gold standard for how to train VO2 max. And this is something we've discussed at length in at least two or three other podcasts that we'll link to. The sweet spot for that energy system is three to eight minutes of work. And what defines that? What defines that is you do as much work as you can at a steady state in that period of time. So it, um, so at the low end of that is three minutes. So meaning how hard can you push for three minutes such that it's roughly the same level of um, work output, so watts, uh, if you're on a bike, for example. Um, but by the end of three minutes, you're truly spent. And then at the upper end of that, it would be up to eight minutes long, which obviously means it's going to be far less wattage, but the same physiologic response, which is by the end of it, you are truly gassed. Um, I've talked about this again. I personally just tend to gravitate to four minutes, four to five minutes is where I like to do the work. Um, but I think it's great to mix it up. Um, and I'll use four minutes as an example, just so folks understand what this should feel like. Um, when I'm doing a four minute interval, I barely notice the first minute. So if at the end of the first minute of a four minute interval, you're dying, you went out way too hard. It's okay. Try, just try, try, try different. Try the next time. Um, at two minutes, I'm still feeling pretty darn good. And believe it or not, sometimes I'm wondering if I'm not, if I shouldn't be pushing a little bit harder. 
At three minutes, I'm truly wearing it. Um, and that last minute is brutal. And that's, again, assuming I'm largely holding power constant for the four minutes. So that's a general rule. The way I describe it is three quarters of the way into the interval. So six minutes if it's an eight minute interval, three minutes if it's a four minute interval, three quarters of the way into, into the interval, you should be at the 50% per percent level of your pain. Um, and so once a person is ready to graduate into a dedicated VO2 max session, that's what I want to do. And I want to see them doing that once a week. Uh, again, if you're training to be an elite level cyclist, you're going to have to do it more than that. But if you're training to just, you know, minimize risk and maximize gain, I want to see people start to push those. And maybe the first time they do it, they can only do four rounds of that. But, you know, Eventually, you'll get up to five, six, seven, eight rounds of that. Again, at, if we're talking about four minutes, and when you put in a warm up and a cool down, and obviously, I should say you're doing that at a one to one work to recovery ratio. I should have mentioned that earlier. So, um, if it's four minutes of work, it's four minutes of uh, very, very passive recovery, um, not act, not a hardcore active recovery. It's it's a true rest and recovery. Um, but again, if you you know we're we're talking about sixty to seventy five minute workouts here. Yeah, and so I think, for what I'm hearing you say is correct, it's one of those as it relates to VO2 max, even though it's so important, and we just looked at all the numbers of why it's so important, it's also one of those in an older population who maybe is deconditioned, you're not pushing them to start VO2 max training right away. Like you, It's important to get the base, and it's also important to take, even when they start VO2 max training, take it slow and it's more important to build that over time than it is to just try to rush into it and either not enjoy it or worst case get hurt that's right and the older and less conditioned you are the less i want you to hurt during those vo2 max intervals like you know and and again i i, I bring it back to me because i can speak from my own experience with much more clarity the level of pain I am in today when I do my VO2 max sets is nothing compared to what it was 10 years ago, Nick. I mean, 10 years ago, it was truly pushing to the point of vomiting. I do not push that hard anymore. Um, I still push hard, probably harder than most people would expect, but it's not that level. And in 10 years, when I'm in my early 60s, it will be even less of a push than it is today. So, you know, the name of the game is play the game and stay in the game forever. And so we are really looking to minimize injury here and we're looking to minimize burnout. And the first few times a person even experiments and dabbles with these four minute intervals, I actually want them to come away thinking that wasn't too bad. Great. Try a little bit harder the next time, but we're, we're not here to, to sort of wipe you out. Um, after the first session or even the first couple of rounds.